guys it's a beautiful saturday morning here in iowa may 1st it is the uh, first saturday of the fourth season of uh, spring turkey here in iowa and i have my oldest daughter out on the home farm we've had uh, some fun family turkey hunts this year so far my wife and bella doubled up on a quick saturday morning hunt a couple of weeks ago in second season and then my second daughter got her bird last saturday in third season they've all got fourth season tags and uh, the turkeys have been pretty active out here so we're trying a new spot on the farm this morning we're actually sitting under the cherry tree stand and uh, the cuttybacks have been showing that the birds have been strutting a lot right here every day around 10 o'clock in the morning and we've seen a few strutters out in this field leaving some of the other mornings so uh high hopes we've had a few birds gobbling on the roost just down uh down the hill there over the creek so we'll see if we can't get one fired up here pretty soon turkey hunt's going a little bit slow this morning. They just haven't been very vocal after fly down. We had a couple of, uh, what looked like a couple of hens skirt us about 30 minutes ago, but um, they're not responding much to the call and they're not gobbling very much. So uh, while we're waiting on some action, I thought I would tell you guys a little bit more about this cherry tree setup. We've got a lot of questions after I killed turkey foot out of this tree last year. As I talked about last summer, I mean, it just was a tree I had my eye on since I bought this place. And then when I purchased the neighboring farm, first place we came was to hang a set in that tree. And the reason being is it's, it's just a natural funnel. We're on the crest of the hill here, big hill, one of the tallest points on this property. And it drops off really steep on both sides. And this ag field's big, basically a dumbbell shape. And so this is just a little 30 yard area from the deep ravine and the fence. And it, there's a similar pattern on the other side. So I've had cameras in this little pinch over time. Just a lot of deer work in this area. And it's a great rub line. This uh, fence line's really, really thick. And you actually, it's full of multiflora rows and bush honeysuckle. So the deer can't see through it very well, which uh, also works to your advantage. Got a lot of questions on the entrance and exit, which is something that's sort of ever changing. When I first set this up, I typically park down by these houses and there's a trail I've got kind of up the creek and then up the fence line to the back of the tree. With the standing corn last year, a lot of the deer were bedded in the corn and they bed down on the creek and it's just really thick everywhere. So I changed my plan and it's, it's not intuitive when you're looking at a map or something that most people would do uh, I think instinctively but um, it's worked really well last year I hunted this set eight or ten times and had multiple hunts in a row that worked really well what I figured out was I would hunt basically on a, a westerly wind which would blow our scent right back down the fence line and because we're on the peak and it drops off so steep I think a lot of the deer can we can blow our scent over them just to the west of the stand, it's the thickest part of the timber. It's really low brush, really gnarly thick stuff, and there's an old fence line in there. And there's not really any deer trails that come up to the back side of that food plot. They tend to walk down along the creek, pop into the cornfield, and work up the fence line, which is what Turkey Foot did that morning, that evening. Or they come up off the creek, just up the hill here, jump the fence into this turnip and hay field. So rather than coming through any of this stuff, we park to the west where there's not a lot of cover and I just walk through the open pasture and I'm walking with the wind, which isn't something you normally would do, but we just sneak in up the edge of the food pot, pop in the tree and it worked really well last year. You know, we'd walk right by these big thickets that are dumped off the edges of the uh, ridge top and 
not 20 minutes after walking by, deer would filter their way up into the hay field. So basically walking past bedded deer. And uh, it's not a spot where a lot of deer sit and stay. They sort of filter through it. So in the evening, we don't typically have a bunch of deer sitting under us. So we can just walk out the way we came and they're down in the cornfield or, you know, we're not busting things up. So that's the general setup. I'm sure it will be modified over time. I've kind of hunted based on the wind, different edges of it, but that cherry tree works really well. It's a big tree, good cover in it. It's high, so deer being close to the tree don't tend to look up at you. And it's worked well for me, obviously. And I think uh, being an, uh, just a natural pinch, it's a good spot in the rut. And then having food on either side of it is just makes it good early season and also I can leave some grain up on this side of the fence line and hunt at late season. So it's going to be a productive spot for me over the years and hopefully that helps make a little more sense out of it. One of our longtime contributing pro staff has been Kane Gillette over the years and he actually purchased a new farm this year. So now we're going to go over to him and check out his new place. Well, welcome back to another episode of Midwest Whitetail. My name is Kane Gillette. Uh, this is my daughter, Emma. It is May 2nd, uh, and we're out here on this beautiful spring day here in Northern Illinois. We're standing here on a newly uh, purchased farm my family has purchased. What we wanted to talk about a little bit today and share with you guys is, is how we got here, how we got standing here on this farm. Prior to this, a little bit of the backstory, uh, I had hunted the same permission farm my whole life. Um, my family had rights to a permission farm for over 30 years. And, and going into last year, you know, we were having a good season. Uh, my daughter was able to harvest her first deer ever on that farm. And then, you know, going forward in the midst of what continued to be a great season, um, you know, we found out we were losing that farm. I guess when you have a permission farm, that's that's always, you know, the reality is something like that could happen. But, I, you know, after that many years, it was just, it was never really something that you considered, I guess. So fast forward to January of 2021 and the season ended here in Illinois. Hoyt had a lifeblood film contest and, you know, it didn't take me long to realize that I had a very important story to me that I wanted to share through that. You know, and the media side of it is something I enjoy as much as the hunting. So uh, we're gonna share that with you guys. And then after the film is over, you know, we'll come back and we'll just kind of briefly touch base on, you know, how we got here. Hope you guys enjoy the film. The farm. You know, it goes without saying that the farm was a special place to me. And in 2020, we were having one of our best seasons ever. Until we got the call. The call that changed everything. This farm we've called home for over 30 years, the farm was sold. This is the farm. The farm is a very special place to me. I've grown up here. This is all I've ever known as far as having a place to kind of call my own in the outdoors. You know, this is where I became the outdoorsman, the hunter, the father that's bringing new hunters into our community. You know, and over the years, the farm became a canvas for me, an ongoing work of art to me. The farm always meant so much to me, obviously. And for me internally, the passion I shared with the farm the most was my passion for whitetails and every year I couldn't wait to illustrate a new plan through the soil of the farm.
Going into the 2020 season, anticipation was high as always for the farm. The grind begins. That always just makes a guy feel alive. The season couldn't have kicked off any better. On opening day this year, I was able to take my daughter Emma with my wife Sarah out, and Emma harvested her first deer on this same piece of dirt that I harvested my first deer and many others on. And that's just a memory, a hunt, that I'll never forget. Emma, you smoked him. That's a perfect shot. I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you, girl. You smoked him. You just shot your first deer. With Emma harvesting that deer, that was the best possible way that the season could have started for me in 2020. And to be riding that high going into some of the really good days of the season was just an awesome experience. You know, but shortly after that, uh, we had learned that this farm that we've called home for over 30 years is going to be listed by the landowner uh, and was going to be for sale. So, you know, every hunt from that point going forward was just kind of a countdown in my head. Uh, the days were numbered. It was pretty inevitable that a sale would happen. Um, and, it, and it was really, it was the beginning of the end uh, for me to share this passion for whitetails with the farm. You know, even with the sale of the farm constantly on my mind, uh, the season still progressed, and admittedly, we were having one of our best seasons ever. You know, not just from a harvest standpoint, but we were having some great encounters and checking a lot of boxes off the list and having great hunts. He's done right here. I guess let's go see him, but man. Oh man. Let's go, buddy. Yo, you did it, dude. Brad. I've been almost this close before. But, uh, yeah, he's been giving me a headache, but I've stayed after it, so it all pays off. Towards the end of December, we learned that the farm had actually sold. And, you know, and, and nowadays, they're literally numbered. And looking back on that, I think the hardest thing for me in that moment 
was just the fact that I wasn't only you know, losing my grace escape in life, a place that I could always be in peace at the outdoors, but my kids, you know, my kids were that were growing into this, um, you know, they were losing what I had looked forward to was sharing was sharing with them for a lifetime, and just learning and growing in the outdoors themselves, on the same farm as I did, and that was a really tough pill for me to swallow. As I sit here today, and potentially one of the last times I'll ever be able to step foot on this farm again, um, I can't help but reflect on the good times. You know, the great memories, the great hunts, the great deer, the great people that I shared the farm with, and, and just the farm in general, and how great it was to me and to my family. Uh, but I sit here and I, I know I'll always get to hold on to those memories. I may not be able to ever physically step foot or walk on the farm again, you know. But but through memory and film, uh, I'll forever I'll forever live this place. Um, I'll forever know the farm. And I'll I'll forever know it for the beautiful piece of art that it was to me. <sighs> this was the farm. <clears throat> Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the film. Um, obviously, that's one that's very important to me. And what I want to talk about now is, you know, uh, like I said, is how we got here. So, you know, in, in the middle of creating that film and then after watching it, you know, numerous times and just reflecting on it, you know, the feeling that that gave me just, you know, going through, you know, the archives of footage, you know, I had years of footage from that farm. You know, I've, I literally have videos of just my kids, like growing up, getting older. And, you know, after seeing all that, I knew that was something I just didn't want to feel again. It's not, I realized it wasn't just special to me for my hunting purpose, but it was just, it was important to me as a, you know, a father now from a family aspect. And I didn't want to ever, you know, feel like having something ripped away from me again. So at that point, you know, my wife and I sat down um, and, and we realized that the best, the best route for us now going forward is going to be just, you know, finding a piece that we could purchase or get in on um, that, you know, couldn't be taken away from us. Um, and, and not even just us, it was important that we could have something that uh, my kids, that, you know, something that they couldn't lose. Um, you know, I think they're all young enough now that they don't realize probably the magnitude of losing uh, the permission farm that we had. So um, it was important to get somewhere where we could build a legacy. 
Um, and and we, like I said, we sat down and there's lots of creative ways you could you can go at it to purchase a farm. For us, the important thing, um, you know, we're a pretty average uh, family and it was important to us that, that any piece that we were looking at, that it had to have good land return. Um, you know, we wanted something where there was some government contracts in place, whether that be, you know, your CRP, your WRP, or even um, there's different timber programs you can do, um, and that was important to us. You know, I also looked at, was looking for farms that had, uh, you know, good select timber cut possibilities in it, that, you know, I could go in there and maybe harvest some timber for some, some return uh, without sacrificing habitat. So, and then, you know, with all that in mind, that was kind of, you know, what we were building off of. And then, you know, we found this farm. Um, this farm showed up and, you know, we realized right away after a few walks, it was one, you know, it could be the one. And, uh, you know, we sat down and at that point we did some brainstorming with some family um, that had similar goals as us and we were able to get the deal done. And and now, you know, we have this, this piece of ground that is, that, you know, the kids can call theirs, you know, that we can build this legacy on forever. And that, you know, that, that's what was really important to me. And that's something, you know, that, that, that's where I wanted to get. I didn't want to have that feeling ever again of you know, having something ripped away from me and you know, just feeling helpless about it. So you know, one interesting thing about this farm is you know, I currently have, I have no MRI on this farm. You know, it, there's, there was no past trail camera pictures or anything like that to reference. You know, I'm familiar with the area. Uh, I know there's, there's good deer in this area. The previous landowner had shared some photos of deer he'd harvested, you know, and, and that was definitely promising, but I'm really excited, you know, to get out here and start running the cuttybacks here this summer. I mean, that's probably the next time you'll see me, but I'm excited to run those cameras and, and start to build that story with different deer and just to flat out see what's on the farm. I'm excited to see the quality of the deer and to see, you know, what we'll be working with. Hope you guys enjoyed the segment. Uh, you know, I'm really, I really appreciate you guys taking time to watch the film uh, and also the show this week. Um, we're really looking forward to the 2021 season and I'm hopeful that it can be our best season yet. Uh, so hope you guys can follow along with us this season and, and maybe you'll get to catch Emma take her first buck ever. So thanks for watching. Overall, a beautiful morning in the Iowa woods. Unfortunately, the uh, turkey hunting was a little bit slow. We sat till about, what, 10.30, and then uh, went walk around the farm a little bit, trying to strike one up, and didn't have any luck. We did pick up a few morels. Five morels. Five morels. So we're gonna go back home and fry those up with a couple of fish, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, lots of projects left to do, and we all got turkey tags in our pocket still, so these next few weeks will be fun. The weather's really been nice and uh, looking forward to what we can get done over these next couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us this week, and we'll see you back next week. Yay.